Is that tough? Get that cock in ya. All right, Walt. Let's do it. Let's do it, brother. Let's Thanks for it. joining me. All good. So it is, what day is it? It is Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning in Chicago. In Chicago. We got a sick view on that side, but we can't really show it off with the light being crappy. But in one of the better hotels this week, huh? Scary is, good. Probably it, the best hotel I've been in in my twelve months of being on the tour. It is, huh? Yeah. It's it's the best. Yeah. Thinking some of the some of the uh, hotels that got put in some of the Italian challenges. This is a joke. Like that was that was crummy. This is yeah. this is epic. This yeah. This is the business for sure. This is the business. Yeah. Um, Dude, so uh, so the last month you've been on a on a solid roll. You've had some good form. Um, just coming from Little Rock, qualling, making semis, taking that momentum into Tyler, uh, and um, and continuing on. Obviously, we had a, a good Dubs week last week. You guys getting chinning us in the final, but it was sick playing all all Aussie Dubs final. Right? Yeah, so it's scary. How's the, how's the last month been? How are you feeling about your tennis? How's your, how's your form? Yeah, no, I've uh, obviously definitely had a pretty good last month, but, you know, I always love playing in the heat and on hard courts, so I knew the American summer was going to be uh, pretty important for me, and I had good spirits going into, you know, the first tournament in Little Rock. I'd had a three-week break when I went and um, played some German club tennis, and so I recharged the batteries, and, you know, I was really, really ready to go at Little Rock, and I wasn't really... Um, burnt out and uh, yeah, was really fresh to start off the summer right. And I was yeah, got lucky and qualified and ended up making a bit of a run there. And then it sort of carried on to the next few of a few weeks and just hopefully we can keep it rolling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's a, yeah, you were down what you were down a, break, a set and a break or a break in the third against McCund. Yeah, so in Little Rock. Last round qualities in Little Rock. I mean, things it's crazy the sport of tennis how quickly things can change. You know, setting a break down there and end up squeezing out that second set and then immediately get broken at the start of the third and you know squeeze that one out there and you know a lot of things can change if you if you don't win that match then you know i've lost in qualifying and then on to the next and uh, and you know it can be tough but i remember yeah after qualifying and then i was like of all spots like they were pretty good and then i actually had to draw yeah fellow aussie polmans and i was like oh probably the worst spot to be in and I'd lost to him, never beaten him, and lost probably three times, I think, prior to that matchup. And, you know, just went in there uh, pretty relaxed and knowing that the pressure's all on him. And, yeah, played pretty well in the heat. It was a very hot match and, uh, you know, carried that momentum. And then I played a guy second round who I'd lost to a month prior, um, you know, and got him in a tight three setter. And, yeah, just sort of. Who was that him. again? That was uh, against uh, the Brazilian De Silva. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. So I lost to him down in Mexico, and then, uh, yeah, I was down a set against him. I was down five all in the second, had, you know, break points on my own serve. So, you know, if, if he converts there, I'd probably lose that one too, but then end up squeezing that second out in a breaker and ultimately got the third as well. And then, yeah, was a bit unlucky in the semis, but, you know, hey, I could have lost last round cues, so I'll take that semi. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great, yeah. And then uh, uh, Tyler, you had a tight three set loss to Sangren. Yeah. yeah. And um, and then Puerto Rico, you had a you had a really good week again playing Pullmans. Yeah. Um, and uh, and getting it done, and then continuing on, you played Nishikori in the quarters. Quarterfinal. So I played uh, Pullmans again in Puerto Rico, and then uh, I played Ruben Staten. Okay. Yeah, in, that's uh, it. Second round, um, and it was probably yeah, obviously the hottest conditions a lot of us had played in and yeah that was brutal I like playing in the heat but that heat was a bit a bit extreme yeah um and then yeah night match against nishi obviously was a bit uh nerve-wracking playing him and then uh yeah had a bit of a battle and then yeah ultimately he he chinned me yeah so he's played nishikori twice now what was it like that I, I watched that match last week and that was some of the best tennis ever seen live like he, he looked like he was playing like a top 10 player what was it like on being on the receiving end of that? Like, just was that the highest level you've ever played against? Yeah, for sure, that was the highest I'd, I'd ever faced. Um, obviously, coming through the college route, you don't get that exposure to them top top guys. And I thought when I played him in Puerto Rico, the conditions were quite slow, and even I was able to get in like a few rallies and just be able to get my my teeth into the match a little bit there. But the conditions were a lot quicker um, in uh, Detroit, and I just felt like. He was getting the first strike and his plus one was ridiculous and 
he just gave me no breathing room and just uh, I felt like I wasn't able to put any scoreboard pressure on and then he was just playing very free um, and he was he was very good that day nothing like when I played him in Puerto Rico I was it was kind of tough too because I'd just come off you know a good run in Porto to make quarters in that chally and then I went and backed it up when one of 25 in Tulsa so my spirits were quite high and then just to get absolutely wiped in an hour from him last week you know sort of put me back in my place a little bit and just had to reset and you know not let one match get to me I've had a pretty good summer and then uh, yeah to turn it around and play a pretty solid match yesterday to get things rolling here in Chicago was was, was a good step yeah awesome man yeah so good and to turn it around and win the dubs yeah and it, the it, dubs it, week too. yeah uh, you know that's I, I'm not obviously uh, fluent with doubles but I do find, uh, you know, I try to play as much doubles as I can. It helps my singles. Um, and then obviously if you don't win, uh, don't do a good run in singles, at least you've got doubles to back it up with and you get a second chance. That's, what, that's the way I look at it anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And are you, so you don't feel like if you're getting in the rhythm of going deep in a lot of tournaments, you're not fearful of playing doubles and, and uh, it hindering your, your, you know, your engine for singles if you're having yeah, a lot of so long singles matches? Obviously, I, I back my engine a lot in uh, singles. Uh, I feel like my engine's pretty good. Um, you know, I played a lot of matches. I played over 100 singles matches uh, last year with college and then uh, the last six months of pro uh, and played doubles a fair bit too. Um, so I feel like... I'm pretty acclimated to playing a lot of tennis. Um, so I don't think that playing doubles is going to hinder um, unless I've gone consecutive weeks yeah. really deep. Um, and in that case, I'll simply just take a week off doubles. Yeah. But it hasn't gotten to that stage where I've ever felt the need to not play doubles yet, um, yeah. especially at the challenger level. Maybe at the, the 15K level, I don't really play much doubles anymore. Hopefully you won't be back there, mate. Hopefully not playing yeah. too many more 15s. But uh, yeah, you know, there's good points in challenger doubles too. Yeah. So I, I don't see the reason not to play. Yeah, and I think it's good for your game because you, you're so comfy at the back. So to get, to you know, improve your volleys and transition game and stuff like that, I think it's for yeah, sure. it's good, it good addition. Singles, uh, yeah, immensely. I mean, yeah. just, you know, to get them volley reps, to get the the fast twitch fibers a little bit yeah. at the net because you know obviously my my baseline game is, is where i've done my damage and so anytime i can get spent at the net in doubles just helps my singles when i come into the net uh, just helps my confidence yeah there, yeah yeah yeah, that's it. Always got to be looking to add layers. Hey, when you're looking at when you're playing to, to looking to break into the top hundred or the, what the top guys have and yeah, yeah you um yeah, you got an unbelievable game. Uh, and such a such a strong base level, but from yeah from what I've seen, players that are uh, are moving up, or they were ones that are able to crack it, are ones that are always trying to add layers. So, yeah, that's for sure. so, so coming out of um, so you've been on tour for a year now. Yep. You've you've I'll, later I'll, I'll ask you more about your college time, but how what, what's it been like as it, uh, compared to what you were expecting finishing college? What you were expecting playing starting to play futures? What was that whole? I mean, you you fortunately you progressed through futures pretty quickly. Uh, you know, you got a couple of titles um, soon after after commencing and. Um, and yeah, your rankings gone up at a at a fast rate. But what was it like compared to what you were um, anticipating entering that futures realm? I know you spent a lot of time at Cancun, but just overall, of, uh, yeah, what was your experience like? Yeah, I guess um, I wasn't really uh, prepared to be on the road, living out of a suitcase for so long. It, that that was one thing that took some time because even we played a lot of matches in college. But we'd always go back to Knoxville every... Like you'd play a match and you'd go back. Yep. And so I guess just spending weeks and weeks at a time away from everything, away from your bases, away from your you know coaches, everything, family, girlfriend, everyone. So I guess that was, that was hard initially. Um, but you get used to it. And I just remember when you do a two or three week swing at the, at the start, like I was in Cancun for the first... I was only there for two weeks, but it felt like forever. Then I went back to Knoxville for two weeks and then went again for three weeks and I was like wow this is it takes time and then I sort of guess this year I felt like the weeks just go a little bit quicker and it's it's it's, it's easier that you've done that I've had that uh, I've done it now um but yeah getting back to what I thought the futures were like um it's tough because when I played the American futures they're very different structured to uh yeah the way Cancun was structured I mean the American futures are off, often hosted at uh college campuses and so I remember going up to Indiana, playing at Notre Dame, and like you know the scoreboard 
things are on, the play sites on, the, the crowds were quite good. We had housing. Um, so it was a really, really nice atmosphere. So you're thinking, oh, this felt future thing is actually not bad, you know? Yeah. Have- then I went to Waco and, you know, same, same thing, played at Baylor and, you know, we had an excellent host family there. And then when you obviously go to Cancun, you're all on your own. And, it's, and it was, that was different. It's a solid reality check. Yeah. Solid reality it's check. Solid. And, then, and it was more the, the fact that, like, I got to Cancun and no one cares. Like, no crowds, no one's there, no one's watching. Uh, you're struggling to find practice courts, balls, everything, and you're just by yourself. And I feel like I was very fortunate to have success because I feel like if you don't have success playing that, it can really destroy your spirits in, uh, in that level for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's an absolute grind, and you can. I've often heard people saying, "Yeah, you could like if you're if you're gonna make it, you got to try and you know not get stuck at futures because it definitely is an element of getting stuck." And and I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, and it's, it's some of those resort setups can be can be pretty brutal when you're doing when it's rinse and repeat. There's no, it's not glamorous. Like, and for you coming out of being a successful college player, playing, you, you've played in front of good crowds at college. You felt if you had hype around you playing for a team, and as you said, you know, you're playing home or away. It's it's an event, you know. Then all of a sudden you're in the sticks at yeah. Cancun. There's no one watching. There's no like it's just it's it's brutal. But it, it it's uh. Yeah, it's a good test. And how do you feel um, pressure wise? Like you obviously had a you had a really good college career. You had you would have had expectations on you to um, to go well once you started playing futures. How does that bother you at all when you feel in pressure of uh, how you should be transitioning? Yeah, so I, you know, obviously I came out of college with zero ATP ranking and just getting into them draws was tough initially. But you know, like they had college is big on UTR, and I'd look at UTR and I'd stack myself against the futures guys and i'd be like okay i was one of the top utr guys so you know i would have that pressure where i I thought i was i I put a lot of pressure on myself and i i thought you know if my utr was higher that i probably should you know be be winning these matches um despite their atp ranking being you know five six seven hundred at that level um and i really felt the need to catch up uh, in college, when I was coming out of college, like I saw a lot of the other Aussies, um, you know, doing pretty well around the 300, 300 mark. And I'm like, well, I, I believe that I'm equally as good as them. And I just felt like them 15 K is like, I, I put so much pressure on myself to literally like win all them because I needed the points to get, to get to my ranking, to get high enough to, you know, kind of match with these guys that I wanted to be matching with. And, uh, yeah, I guess, College prepared me to deal with pressure. I mean, I was expected in college to win a lot of matches too. So uh, you can, it works both ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a good platform, man. Like when, <clears throat> so I'm a couple of years older than, you, older than you. When I was, the kind of echo chamber I was around and the influence I had to, to go to college, it was it was almost, and I know it's improved a lot. And so I'm coming from a bubble in, in sunny coast or in Australia. I was, my perspective on it was that it was, in some ways, a means to an end for your tennis and not a springboard. And then in the last 10 years, it's become uh, much more of a springboard into pros and we've seen so many successful players. And uh, now that I look at it, in, in hindsight, I'm thinking it was would have been an unbelievable opportunity and it's so good to prep you for for life. But also, if you're just looking at it as a, for pro, from a pro tennis player perspective, playing pressure matches, you know, d- um, dealing with... Uh, yeah, just de- dealing with that kind of pressure early on, having a lot of having good structure around you and everything. Um, uh, so um, it obviously worked worked well, really well for you. But I'm going to take you back to there was I reckon you were maybe halfway through your degree, or, and uh, you came you were coming back to Australia in the the summer US summer holidays, Australian winter, and I'd see you probably once a year there. We'd train at the, at the National Academy at Brisbane together. And I remember chatting to you, I reckon you're halfway through and you're doing really well at college, but you were saying to me, uh, you, you weren't that convinced that you would actually carry on playing tennis after college and you were, um, you seemed, uh, yeah, you, um, you seemed like you loved tennis and you seemed like you love what your, your collegiate career, but you didn't seem, um, unbelievably motivated to, to, to push for the pros. And, and, uh, do you remember that? And when, when did that change? What changed? Yeah. I remember I, I went into college. Uh, it was definitely the right decision to go to college because I, you know, wasn't that good enough. I was would have been losing first rounds of of future level matches, um, and it was a bit of a no brainer for me to go to college. I, I hate the the stigma that uh, 
that Australian tennis has around college. I still think it's better, but it's still well off where it needs to be in terms of they think it's a means to an end when it's, it's absolutely not. It's yeah. that's not true. Uh, and people, I, I think a lot of juniors think that they're locked into this this four year deal when they're really not. You just got to look at Ben Shelton, for example, two years and done. Yeah. Ethan Quinn just recently one year yeah. and done. Because when you're 18 and you're looking at a four year thing, it yeah, seems like it's eternity. Yeah. You think, oh, I've got to be locked in for this for four years. When you don't, you can leave at any time. Um, but for me, like, yeah, getting back to that, I, I, I was never my first year. I was barely ranked in college. Um, there was a lot of I just realized that so many guys can play tennis. Uh, and then even the second and third years, my ranking was improving in college, but it was never to a point where I really thought that I could be a successful tennis player. Um, I just didn't have that belief. And then, so that's obviously went, getting back to your point, I was coming back and, you know, I still love the sport. I just, just didn't honestly believe I was good enough. Um, and so then that's when I was considering like, you know, I'll, I'll finish my degree and get it and then and probably move on from, co- from tennis. Um, and it really, I remember my fourth year, me and Pat Harper actually won the NCAAs and that whole summer, it was during COVID and I, I didn't touch a racket. I, uh, put the rackets down, started doing a bit of coaching and just enjoyed America. Back in Oz or in, no, no, uh, in, in America? In the States, yeah, it was yeah. in 2021. Yeah. I, I, we, me and Pat won that doubles and yeah, literally that whole summer. I was just coaching back in Knoxville and, uh, you know, enjoying time off um, because I really, again, after, even after that fourth year, didn't think that, uh, you know, the singles pathway for me was going was gonna to work out. And then I guess that three-month break, um, it did a lot of good things. I, uh, I come back in that fall really hungry to work again and uh, started playing some of the best tennis that I'd played and, and had a really good last year um, uh, in my singles. So last year being your fifth year, my fifth did you have a fifth year because of COVID? Because or? of COVID. Okay. And uh, that fifth year, uh, I really felt like I finished second in the ranks behind Ben. Uh, and I felt that, um, you know, I really should give it a crack. Um, yep. And then obviously to have that success straight away at the 15K level, I really thought, okay, like let's continue this because yeah. you've obviously got something there. Yeah. Um, had it had I lost, you know, a fair few first rounds of fifteen k level straight out of college, it might not be this. I might not be sitting here today, but uh, I just felt like that early success just propelled me to want to keep going. Yep. And uh, sure. So and that's ultimately, why? Yeah. Yeah. Epic. And what? Uh, so in your fifth year, you're playing number one singles. I've played number one since my third year. Okay. Uh, so my yeah. first year, I played line four and three, and then my second year, line two. And then, yeah, from third on, third, fourth, and fifth, I played line one. Yeah. Yeah. And how, uh, when you when you got to college the first time, so you fi- so you finished high school in ch- at Churchy. Yeah. When you went to college, um, what were you daunted? What were you expecting? And uh, what what was the what was the what was a week to week or day to day schedule like when you first went to college? What was your program like? Yeah, it's uh, obviously pretty intense. Um, I remember it wasn't that daunting, daunting because I went to boarding school in Brisbane at Churchy. Good so prep for it. That was excellent prep because I'd been at home and then I left. You know, leaving your parents at fifteen and and doing everything yourself. I grew independence pretty quick and I was a kind of a bit of a fussy eater. Um, yeah all the way up until boarding school and you sort of learn to be less fussy about things yeah. and, and just uh, sort stuff out on your own. Yeah. And so moving to college was sort of like doing that same whole process again. And even like from a friend group standpoint, I remember going to, to Churchy, not knowing barely anyone. Uh, yeah. I'd, what I'd, year, what grade did you I go to grade Churchy? grade 10. So, I, so I'd 15 come all or 14. From grade one through nine with all my friends from Home Hill where yeah. this town is small, everyone knows everyone, had a, good friend base there and then you go and you know no one yeah and having to create friends again was tough um and then doing it the second time around at tennessee i felt was was far easier and that transition wasn't really tough and then you know as a training standpoint i was still training pretty heavily at the start of that year uh at tennyson and so basically I thought the training my first year in college was was pretty similar in terms of hours and and demand, but you have to add the element of school. 
Yeah. And so now I'm doing school and tennis, and it was it was a lot at the start because I was actually doing engineer an engineering degree the first six months, yeah. where I was taking all these like intro engineering classes, and it was actually a lot of schoolwork. And I realized pretty quickly that if I was wanting to, you know, play some a lot of tennis like what they wanted that I probably can't keep doing engineering and then I ended up uh, changing to kinesiology, which yeah. took the workload off a little bit and, uh, you know, helped help me have a life too because, you know, you obviously want to enjoy college yeah. life. So. How many hours a day were you on court? We so. were probably, in the fall I got there, we were probably doing anywhere from two to three. Yeah. I wouldn't say it was any more than three. Um, but the one big shock I had was uh, the gym program. Yeah. It was very different to to the, what I was doing in Brisbane. They like to lift uh, heavy um, and they're very, we had a football strength and conditioning coach. And so his mindset was just like really lift heavy and put on a lot of muscle. So I remember that first uh, six months, I ended up putting on 10 pounds, uh, but not body fat. It was just, I stayed the same. You do all your tests and everything. And yeah, put on a lot of muscle. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's good, some ways it's not. Um, it's just what colleges like to do and, yeah, just getting accustomed to the different training style was probably the, the biggest change in the first six months going there. Yeah, true. Yeah, especially when you have a, have a football gym coach yeah. and they want to post numbers and what and looking, you know, look, lifting heavy is is good is a good looking attribute yeah. for a, for a gym coach in yeah. a way. But sometimes can't be the isn't the best yeah. route for a tennis player, yeah. especially someone like you. You want to maintain. I mean, obviously you're still super slim. But you want to get around the court quickly. Yeah. Cool. So then, um, so when you first started studying engineering, were you thinking you would finish uh, college and and follow that yeah, route? Yeah, probably. I mean, at the time going into college, I was just I come in there with a pretty open mind. I mean, I was our, our team. I committed to a school ranked forty four. Yeah. Um, I could have gone probably to a school ranked higher, but we had a great Aussie tradition at Tennessee, and I just felt you know it was the right fit. I, I wanted to go somewhere where I'd at least yeah. play. Who helped you um get there? Was yeah, it Hodgie? So, uh, uh, Dave Hodge helped me yeah. uh, a little bit. Uh, and I was talking with Ryan Smith, a former player on yeah. that team, and Scotty Jones, obviously a good friend of mine, was was on the team already as well. So just hearing all the good stuff that they'd said, and uh, you know, I got a good deal there, um, and to where my parents don't have to pay too much money. So I just thought, you know, I may as well go there. I can play without lineup pressure too. I knew I was never gonna not play in the top six. I mean, yeah. I played four my first year, four and three, but. Um, I think to have that pressure off my back really helped just play a little bit more free because yeah. I've seen so many good good uh, juniors better than me go into college and uh, they want to go to these top schools and then they're fighting for five, six, seven yeah. and it can be a slippery slope. Yeah. I've, seen it, I've seen it go both ways where guys excel but I've seen it where they end up sitting on the bench. They were top 10 in the world juniors and then end up sitting on the bench for a top team and yeah, nuts. it can be no fun. So I always wanted to go somewhere where I'd play. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. That's huge, Jay. Eh? Um, and so you mentioned like going to churchy and just I don't know. There's something about dealing with a bit of adversity as a young fella. Like to, that tennis can be good for for that as well, and it can set you up well uh, for the adversity adversity you're going to come across later, inevitably. But you mentioned so you were, so for those who don't know, Home Hill is n- North Queensland. It's a very small, isolated place. Well, the whole of North Queensland is pretty um, rural and uh, and isolated. So, uh, so when you went to church, it would have been pretty pretty daunting for you. And um, so, did you? Had you had you uh, make the call to go to Churchy? Did you get a scholarship there? Yeah, got a got a scholarship there. It was actually my brother. He went a year early. Ah, true. Um, yeah. So he went in grade ten, and I was still in grade nine back in back in Home Hill. And I remember I was hitting uh, two times a week. I hit uh, Friday mornings and Tuesday mornings. In Home Hill, in Home Hill. with your bro? Uh, no, with my coach because my brother was at Churchy. Is that uh, Clumpy? Clumpy. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> me, and, me and Clumpy were out twice a week, and that was yeah. it. Yeah. And in the afternoons, I remember after school, I would I would literally be on the on the quad bike with my friends down at the river. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like that's just what we did. Yeah. Uh, and it was a bit of a shock when I went to Churchy. We started hitting, you know, four or five yeah. times a week. Were you pushing to go? Or your parents pushing more? Uh, no, I wanted to go. Um, were you thinking bro- tennis-wise? or Yeah, you yeah. So my brother um, went initially yeah. and he, he was loving it. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I, I always liked playing tennis. I've always yeah. liked playing tennis. And so uh, when he went and he really liked it, I thought, okay, let, like, I want to go too. So 
I mean, we had that scholarship, and and it was great. Looking back at it, I loved my my boarding school days at Churchy. Just I learned that discipline of of actually doing pretty tough schoolwork. The school loads at Churchy were insane, um, and then just having your friends around you constantly. I remember every night we would uh, after the homework session was done at eight o'clock, we'd all go out to the touch football field, start as touch football, then two handed touch, then tackle while the yeah. and the uh, teachers weren't looking and we'd come all in all sweaty at nine o'clock and shower up and then uh yeah hit the hay and it was them days you just look back at it and they were so much fun yeah good at my say scary at my say. yeah epic dude um yeah uh so what about um i don't know if you got into it at her churchy but what about dealing what about obviously you're a social fella you like what about uh navigating how much is too much partying through college and how much is all right because you want to you got to have a life experience and you got to socialize and you got to have a balance and everything anything you're doing and you're trying to balance um through your college career of uh of tennis uh, academics um but yeah uh, how'd you go about um partying and did you feel uh yeah what what, what was it like and did yeah. you did you have to hold it's back or? because um I know when I came into college, we were ranked not very high and, and the guys on the team maybe weren't that tennis focused at times. And so I remember that my first year, we you know we went out quite a lot and, and, and we had our fun. Um, but our tennis grew better pretty quickly as a team. And you know once you establish your team ranking inside the top 20, top 15, top 10 even, you, you, you become more serious at that and then you, you end up... Uh, your whole team sort of shifts their, their way of thinking and then all of a sudden, Friday night after a dual match, you're not going out. And then uh, I really felt like from my second year onwards, we were a little bit more disciplined. But, you know, we still loved going out as a team and I think it's important to go yeah. to, to have some fun at, at times. And, I mean, if you if tennis is all you breathe and live, like you're going to get burnt out. So just to have that, that social aspect for me, obviously, is huge. I just, you know, like being in a social setting so yeah 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 i love it um and then uh money wise man i've spoken to you um i've always uh admired the way you've you've made things happen yourself you don't you're not coming from a, a gold carpet family where you where um everything's rolled out for you and uh which i think um is pays credit a lot to the way you from what i've seen you, you manage your life you know because you you understand the uh how to not not to have a scarce mindset but you understand just how to manage your money um and just uh and and appreciate and gratitude and have gratitude for for all the small things remember you coming back from one college semester probably around the same time that you were that i was mentioning you're talking to me about not potentially pushing on with your tennis but you're working out west and gun to windy remember that what were you, do, you doing that. fencing or something i do remember that i was actually painting painting, painting. the house and uh doing a little bit of uh cattle work yeah um but yeah, yeah. I, had to, I had to put some money in the account, so and my brother was also doing it, and then uh, I was like, you know what, I'll go out with you. I remember I play, played that Queensland AMT, I played Gavin in that final of that Platinum, and then uh, that night we, four hours out to Gundawindi, and was out there for the next two weeks painting No the way. Doing some cattle work, um, and yeah, it just was what it was. I just had to, yeah, get a bit of money. Yeah, that's, it. that's epic, dude. Do you feel like... Uh, from my perspective, I feel like just that that mentality has does help you now because you uh, you're also you're not waiting for anybody else to to push you. You know, you know that it's up to you, and you and you're um yeah, you're pl- like you got to those kind of kind of skills are, are vital in tennis. Hey, to to know how to budget, know how to know how to plan, know how to spend your money, and. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, also know that when you're out there, I feel like people that are um, self-funded have got way less chance of tapping out of training sessions or tapping out of matches because yeah. you just you know that you've done the work to actually get there and you know that the opportunities don't come easily without, you know, the foundations that you've put in yourself. So yeah. um, would you say that like just that, that mentality or those, that, you know, the, those experiences help you as a tennis player? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, also... You can look, I, I also hustled, like last year, like you have to do a bit of hustle work where I know some, you, you know, you can go out and you can get your own hotel room by yourself and spend a little bit more and do all that. But I remember like in the future level, like come home to Australia, I'm, I'm sharing beds with one of my mates just to save some costs. Like, thankfully um, it's Humi. Yeah, thankfully it's <laughs> Humi. But, 
Um, you know, it was just what we did. And then, like, I was lucky when I went to Cairns. I had a former friend that I've always had up there that, like, you know, let me stay at his house for two weeks. It was just huge. And, like, yeah, I, I did hustle it a little bit. In Cancun, we stayed four or five guys in this one apartment. Like, it was... We were all hustling in this little car to and from the tennis every day. Obviously, the U.S. is good because a lot of the tournaments will house you um, at the future level, which doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Um, and then, obviously, you know, I'm still on the pro streamer. Like, I still try save every time, everywhere I can. And I just feel like them little bit of savings can really add up over the course of, you know, a couple of months to a year. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Could because... Is the is the is the managing of finances or the lack or the did it did it um, surprise you at how expensive it is and how little money you make because you came onto the future scene you're starting winning you're winning fifteen k's but even if you're winning fifteen k's yeah you're still sometimes coming out negative you're still sometimes coming out negative it's nuts I remember the flight like the one thing I really found out pretty quickly was how expensive flights were um, obviously in college you don't have to worry about a thing about financial because they pay for it all and you get your nice hotel room and everything. But uh, yeah, I thought uh, flights was the number one cost of a tennis player um, because you're always having to book last minute flights too. It's not like you can book a flight two months in advance where you can get them a bit cheaper. I mean, for instance, we're going up to Canada next week and we not haven't booked a flight yet because we're sort of waiting on how this tournament goes to know when to go to the next one. And it's, it's a tough act. And so you're obviously getting late last minute flights and I just think, you know, it can add up. So the more you can save during the week, then, then obviously you have to splurge a bit on flights because you have no choice. Yeah. So I think the things that you have choices on, I've tried to be pretty pretty smart about. And then obviously when it comes to, to flying or ACOM or anything like that, where sometimes you just have no choice, you just got to chin it and uh, know that that's going to be expensive at times. Yeah. Yeah, there's... Uh yeah, there's a brutal factor of just booking flights last minute that kills you, and then you got baggage as well. But um, it's a I'll tell you what, playing this plane futures actually does set you up for massive appreciation for when you like right now the, the, in this US swing. I've been a lot of the tournaments. I'm only paying for dinner. You know, got to come. Got a nice hotel for free, breakfast. transport to and fro courts, breakfast. A lot of the US tournaments they put on put on lunch. Yeah. You know, it, it's really well done. So that it helps a lot. But even uh, yeah, it's funny, speaking of Matty Hume, he was messaging me the other day because I posted the Insta story of the view from this room and he was like, oh, you're balling, brother, you know, made it. And I was like, yeah, you know, Charlie life's nice. You're losing less money than you're, you're losing at Futures. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Futures yeah. is obviously the most expensive because of the, the ACOM aspect. And then, yeah, it's obviously much nicer at a, at a Challenger and obviously I don't know, but I'm assuming it's much nicer at the Tour. Exactly, um, yeah. I just, there's different levels of tennis and I think, society sees the top end and they think how glamorous the sport is when i would just love like a like a netflix around the futures tour and just yeah. to see i mean i'd love the public just to see what cancun was like because that that for me was was the trenches of the trenches yeah i was gonna like, say it's probably a good place that you started there because yeah. so now they've been shut down they can't hold tournaments there anymore can't right hold tournaments there um but yeah it, it was it was tough going there like yeah we didn't stay on site and I just remember like I was trying to warm up before my final and I couldn't get a court uh, and then they ended up giving me 10 minutes before my final where I was warming up and, and just like stuff like that is just ridiculous and uh, yeah eye opening I guess yeah and, and, and I just think that everyone sees on TV Wimbledon or, or the Grand Slams and, and, and they think that tennis life is so luxurious when it's when it's quite not for for the most majority of people trying to play tennis yeah yeah it's yeah it doesn't it's just brutal when you uh even if you're talking about it i found this with a lot of friends of talking about it mentioned what it's like and everything and still seems even just the thought of it oh it's still you're traveling to different countries like you're with you know you're with a, a crew of mates in a way it, it, like obviously there are elements of it that are still epic and that and that motivate you and get you through but uh when you got yeah, just it, it can grind you down. I've seen players go overseas and uh, for the first time and almost and just you almost want to end your tennis career, you know, six months into your first futures trip because you're realizing how bottlenecked it is to actually try and move up. Yeah. And uh, as you said, when you, you when you realize shit, there's a lot, a lot of good tennis players out there, and how am I going to get through this trench? And that's why I think it's so it's been yeah so uh, impressive that you could move through the futures quickly and. Um, 
yeah, and then be playing uh, playing better events, and then you got a better chance of it's it's easier to play better tennis, right? When you're playing, when you got better balls and better courts, it just the conditions are more consistent. Some of the futures venues you've got different speeds, different courts. I feel like it's easier to if you lose first round at a at a at a nicer event, it's easier to actually put in good training. You've got a gym on site generally, right? Yeah, right. So um, it's easier to to keep improving because I feel like when you're yeah, you got to keep. Um, being specific along the way to get better yeah i also felt like obviously at the challenger level uh everyone's a professional they take it very professionally and there's no there's no gimme matches where i found like you know sometimes your first round or two at a, at a 15k future you're just better than the guy and it is what it is uh they're not as professional they'll rock up just before their match they're not doing the right things if they lose they'll take you know a few days off hitting and then they'll just roll into the next event Whereas, you know, I feel like once you start progressing up and, and going to, obviously, the challenge or even the top end of the futures, the guys are treating it as their job. And I really think if, if you want to make strides in the sport, you, you've got to treat it as a job and you've got to see it as a job. Um, and then, obviously, if you lose, you've got to be out, the, out of the practice courts and put in a good week of training just to get ready for the next because... I mean, it's, it's a brutal sport. I mean, half half the draw will lose first round and then only one guy wins the tournament. So you're yep. losing every week. You've got to learn how to lose and you've got to learn, you know, to, to, to wipe... You've got to have a short-term memory. You've got to, you've got to wipe off the losses and, and move on to the next really, really quickly. I mean, last week I lost in one hour. You just have to you just have to forget about it. If you just let it linger around, it, it'll... It, it'll spiral downhill pretty mm-hmm. quickly. Do you watch your matches? Do you if you take a you take a tough loss, will you watch it or not? Uh, typically no. Uh, maybe sections of it. Um, last ma- last week's match against Nishikori, I definitely did not watch any of that. I don't want to. Yeah. Watch any of that. that <laughs> but was, you feel uh, like you got a pretty good gauge of what went on out yeah, there, so you don't I, I feel, feel like, like. I feel like uh, my my I know what what happened out there, and and I know what. I could have done better. I know what he did really well. And what about when you're playing good matches? If you play really, will you go back and watch them a bit? Uh, portions. Uh, sometimes if I'm feeling like uh, like I want to see how I acted in a particular situation in, in a deep in a set like four all five all, because um, obviously that's where it matters most. And I I'll go back and watch portions of it. But I'm not a big 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 watcher of uh, my previous matches. I'd rather just use my time elsewhere um and i often will like before i play a guy will maybe watch five ten minutes of their match prior just to see if i can see any little any little uh whether they like to serve or 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 their strengths or if they run around their backhand for instance or something like that anything i can think of real that might help me in the match but uh try not to overlook it every match is different what worked when they played another guy might not work when they play me so you got to keep pretty open about that. Yeah, and I think there's an element of not overthinking and knowing that yeah. uh, it's it's pretty much 80% your game every match, Correct. no matter who Correct. you're playing, right? So you got to know your strengths and know how to implement them. And yeah. Um, yeah, so you mentioned getting over losses. Yeah, as you say, you got to have a kind of uh, short-term memory loss in a, in a sense because if if you play what 35 weeks in the year, you're probably losing, you know, 31 of them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, do you think that uh, the college experience of playing matches weekly, and do you think do you think that helped you learn how to get over losses? Because I feel like uh, what people that uh, I just feel like it's just a massive strength. People that can actually get over losses because obviously it means a lot to to all of us if we're, if you're here devoting your life to do it. So it's easy to buy into the the pain and and actually get down um, yeah. from losses. Do you reckon it helped you? Yeah, it did. The one thing I I noticed quick pretty quickly on the tour was like. I'll, when in college, you lose and you get the chance the next day or two. Like, whereas the futures, if you lose early or any tournament, you lose early, you got to wait a whole week. And mm-hmm. I hated that aspect, even all the way up until probably the start of this year. It took me six months really to to get used to that. I remember going up to to Darwin and I lose in the in the quarters, and I was really like, dang, I got to wait seven days before I get to play again. Like that that that's a long time to wait. Um, and so. I guess you got to learn that that was a learning block but college I was you know my last two years I was expected to win a lot so obviously them losses every time it, it hurt for me personally and I also think when you play college tennis you're playing for some th- something bigger than yourself so you always have that extra pressure that you don't want to let the team down 
and so the loss doesn't only hurt you, you feel like you've kind of let the team down a little bit, and so you just got to kind of... I feel like when you lose, you know, when you're playing for yourself, like, it's, it's really... You, you're the only one that's affected, whereas when you lose... I felt sometimes when I lost at college, especially if you lose a big match and your team end up losing, you're like, well, if I dug that mm-hmm. out, we maybe could have won that match. Yeah. And that's pretty easy to get depressed on. Did you work with a psychologist at all during we college? We did. Uh, do, and college, do you anymore? Uh, I have at times. I remember uh, I was actually playing uh, Kyle Seelig. He got me a bunch last year and he got me at the start of this year. And I remember the very next week after he got me in February, I was playing him again in the semis and... I was like, I've got to talk to someone. Like, this guy's got my number. I'm just mentally very weak when I play this guy. And, you know, we, we chatted on the phone for probably 60 minutes, just a long time, just chatting how to navigate my emotions. And, uh, you know, it helped me get over that line for that, that match. And, and we still keep in touch I, with the Tennessee guy I keep in touch with. So nice. He's been good, yeah. Yeah. So when you're in a big moment and a big match, you seem to – uh, you have a very pretty steady temperament. You don't go up too high. You're not wasting energy on like exerting celebrations all the time, and you know don't go too low. Just like your game style, you're pretty steady, right? So you know yourself pretty well. Um, what what are the, under pressure? How much like in the pro playing pro? How much does uh, like say right now you're in the position to you know you're looking like you're in a good position to make US Open qualifying when you're in a big match. Um, how much is that? How much is the externals? Are the externals coming into your head? The the points and uh, the, you know, the just all the all the all the noise it's outside. Tough. And how much are you, f- are you focusing on? You know, the task at hand, the next point, or yeah, very tough. Uh, obviously, never been in this situation. This is all first time round for me. And then obviously having the chance now to maybe make U.S. Open. Tough not to think about. Anyone in my yep. position would be thinking about it. Um, and. I've sort of kept telling myself, like, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I put my head on the pillow the same way. Um, and it's not the be-all, end-all. If I, if I make it, unbelievable. I, I'd be thrilled. But if I don't, like, life continues. And uh, I guess that helps relax me um, because I am very close. Like, I, I, I'm only, you know, a few, few wins away from making it. But I'm also a few losses away from not making it in these next three weeks. And obviously, it's pretty important. Um, you know, to be able to play calm tennis when I like when it's going to matter these next three weeks, and uh, yeah, at the end of the day, if it happens, I'll be over the moon. But if it doesn't, it's all good. I'll, yeah, I got next year. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So you've got to play. You got a wild card in the Aussie Open qualies this year. You went out and beat Pablo Andrew uh, one and two. I want to say, and he, you know, indirect over Feds. Yeah. He's a he's a freaking season player, right? He's been yeah. around. He's uh, has he been top fifty? Uh, or close I think to career high thirty nine. Yeah. From when I looked at it back in yeah. uh, January. Yeah. What was that experience like playing AO and being able to obviously come out with some good tennis and not get overwhelmed with the occasion? Yeah. So I'll take it back a little bit, and I ended the year on a four match losing streak. I uh, I went and I played the Australian Challies, and then I straight away went over to Knoxville and Champagne, and I lost first rounds there too. And I remember I played Chris Eubanks, who's now thirty in the world, first round of Champagne, and. I really put. The, I was like, dang! Like I had a very good year. I won three futures titles, but I ended the year on, on a four match L streak. And I was yeah. Like, dang! And then uh, started. I went over and played that Uni Games in France in December, which probably hindered my preseason a little bit. Um, but I'd never done a preseason, so I didn't really know that at the time. And so my preseason was a little short. If I how long did you have? I had about. Uh, I started training, I think around the tenth. Of December, no, it would have been. Later. Did you put the rackets down 30, for a bit? Uh, honestly, no. Yeah. No, I, I over Thanksgiving. I remember I come back from Champagne. I took a few days off before I went to France, but then I played that France event and probably started back around you know tenth to thirteenth of December, which was a, probably a little bit too late um, because I'd been in the the cold indoors for the last month, and then obviously training back in Brisbane and that's tough. Is, it was tough. Yeah. Um, so I know this time around, this December, I want to just put in a, I want to work like a dog in December and, you know, start a little earlier. And then I go, I go to Canberra, I get a wild card into qualies there and I play Enzo Cacao who ends up the next week qualying and winning a round and losing to Djokovic in four. The only guy that got a set of him. The only guy that got a set and I, I played in first round qualies and I lost that one too. And, you know, you have little doubts creep in your head. You're like, am I really at this level? Like, do I really deserve well, not deserve, no one deserves a wild card. You get rewarded. Um, but, like, 
am I good enough to play against these guys in the Oz Open qualies? And I remember I was with our strength coach, Tommy Mabon, in uh, Canberra. The, the facilities there are unreal to, to train at. So I lost in qualies and made the decision to stick around in Canberra for the week and just, just put in a really good training week. And me and Tommy were in the gym every day doing movement. Uh, I was training with a bunch of guys there in uh, Canberra. And so I felt like I was, I was in pretty very good physical shape going into Melbourne, which helped my confidence. You know, when, you, when, you, when you've taken a few on the chin, you can only back your work to keep believing for success. And uh, I'd know I'd put in the work. I, I'd know I'd worked hard. And to see it pay off at Oz Open, I saw my draw and I'm like, well, this guy, you know, he, he's been around. He's played good guys, but he's also, he's played main draw. So for him to play qualies is a bit of a, yeah. I guess, uh, you know, he's been, he's been at greater heights. So I, I knew his tennis was on, on, the, uh, on the downhill from his career because he had such a good career. And so I was, I was in high hopes when I played him. And yeah, just come out of the blocks really uh, ready to go and just wanted to embrace the opportunity. And, and I played a really, really solid match. And, you know, even my next round, I, I remember having day off and then I'm playing uh, Peter, this German guy, Gojwick. Go yeah. And I, and I went in that set and got up a break in the second and uh, I was playing really good tennis. I was, he's a former top 40 player too. So I was, I was there and then I ended up losing 6-4 in the third to him and that really made me believe like, you know, I can match it with these guys and uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be stoked to play US Open Qs if I could get in, like just to get that another opportunity to play qualities of a Grand Slam and obviously that's where, you know, a lot of money is and, and then tennis players want to get to that level to play the grand slams so yeah 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 it's epic and it's we're, we're lucky as aussies uh um you know like for you to have that experience under your belt playing getting that wild card in the australian open playing a big you know big big tournament one of the four biggest in the world and are going to put you in better stead if, if you if and when you do um quality for us if not you'll be there you'll be there asap for yeah. sure at that level man you yeah. you uh yeah you belong there you look comfy i think it's an element of not uh uh, um, there's a case of putting those guys on a bench on a pedestal and thinking that you have to play different how you usually play and because we, you know we know the margins are so small in tennis I feel like a lot, I was chatting to Kovacevic yesterday he was telling me about his experience playing Novak at Roland Garros and um, yeah he was saying the thing that was uh, that impressed him the most was how unimpressible um, Novak was like he was he, yeah, he just, he, it's not like he's smacking winners off the court, you know. He's, maybe it's different playing Alcaraz, but he's just very measured, playing okay. within himself, you right. know. And if you can, when you go play levels up, like I think if you feel like you got a, you got a good enough first bowl as well, you're going to get some cheap points, then you play within yourself. And, uh, you know, you're not, you're not pressing too hard just because the guy's been 40 in the world or whatever. Um, yeah, as you found out now, you can, you know, you can make inroads. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, so... So you're kind of based in the US, like you, you know, obviously you'll go to preseason again in Brisbane. I'm assuming. Yeah, right? for sure. I. Um, but how how's it been? Uh, um, as you're finding out now this like, this year of how much travel you have to do, and uh, epic thing about America is conditions that you play really well in. It suits you, and you're comfortable just m moving around um, day to day activities. It's all, almost home to you, and. Uh, but uh, yeah, how do you think you'll navigate the um, the next? If you're assuming you're, you know, you're gonna have it, you you're looking at potentially ten years on tour. You think, um, you know, you'll spend, you'll you'll kind of have a base in the US or? Yeah, I think obviously uh, December January time I'll be in in Oz and I'll put in a good preseason every year in in Brisbane uh, in December and then start the year off in Oz and then you know throughout the year obviously it's very expensive to go back to Australia and now I've just got my P1 visa so. Uh, traveling in and out through the US is a lot easier for me. How do you get your P1? What's your P1 so visa? P1 is a professional athlete visa. Oh, um, did you? So how do you apply for that? You got to go through a lawyer, and then you yeah. just, uh, you know, you basically say like, this is what I'm wanting to do for a job, and you show them your ranking, your accolades, and all that yeah. stuff, and you pay them a big check, and yeah, and then they wait and hear back, and then you finally get approved or denied, and I was lucky enough to get approved. So, so is that P1 specific for US? Yeah, it's yeah. specific for US. You get five years um, yeah. of where you're not needing no outbound flight. You don't have to leave after Yeah, that's day. so none good. Of that, none of that um, rubbish. So, 
you know, for someone who's been in the US for the last five years, obviously that's that's handy because my P, my F one, my school visa, obviously doesn't let me in anymore. Yeah, not not a student. Um, very comfortable in the US. Uh, there's a lot of events. Uh, it's much cheaper, just geographically to where it is in comparison to Australia. Um, to get to and from tournaments, there's a lot more events held here. It's unbelievable how many events there are. I'm just looking at my schedule for the rest of the year, and I'm like, obviously, there's potential to go to China when USQ starts, but yeah. you actually have the option of, like, it's look safe. at Ben Shelton, man. Yeah, it's, yeah, he got it's unreal. Without ever leaving the, co- without ever leaving yeah. the country. So just goes to show of, like, the events here. Like, you can, you can make it just by staying relatively close, and obviously I like the hard courts where the US is mainly hard courts. And... Uh, you know, feels like home. Got my girlfriend here in Knoxville and the training base in Knoxville, the coaches are really good to me there. So I can always go back there whenever I need and, uh, and, and train there. So uh, to have that second base almost is, is, is huge. Yeah, awesome. And then having a car to get around the US, oh, you've been helping me out a bit. It's, it's, no, it's crazy good. It's, it's great, good yeah. Setup. And uh, so looking ahead, do you, are you one to set goals ranking wise uh, or do you j- just focus on your game and... Yeah, I, uh, I had some goals. Uh, I know when I come in onto the tour, I wanted actually to end the year top 500. Um, that was when I was going doing the trench work in Cancun. I was like, all right, I need to get, I want to get top 500 by the end of the year. And I ended up, I think got to about 430. Yep. Um, so I, I did that goal. And then I really wanted to just, uh, like for the 12-month period, fill up all my results, um, not have zeros, just to try to sort of play catch-up work and, and – spend a full time on tour and now that i've done that now i'll start setting some goals yeah. obviously uh so for those who don't know you have 16 spots to fill your ranking i think it's 18 actually. 18 18, 18 single yeah. spots it might be 16 in dubs true i'm dubs so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 18 uh, spots to fill 18, your best 18 tournaments so, in the year so basically the more tournaments you can play it helps because yeah. you can have you know the more of the 18 that you can fill up the higher your ranking will be obviously because yeah. the more points you would have and then uh U.S. qualies was always was always a minor goal of mine or major goal I should say, but um, again, like if, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And then I know ever since I've gone into college that every year I've just gotten a little bit better. And so long as I always see little bits of improvement in my game, I feel like I can keep kind of climbing the rankings hopefully. And uh, you know, the higher you can climb, I'm getting to that point where you know I can start playing more a lot more challenges and hopefully get out of that futures altogether. And then if you can play challenges and then maybe some tour events as well, the life becomes a little bit easier because, you know, the trench work's done in the futures. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, dude. And uh, after tennis, have you got any idea what you would do? Would you stay in tennis or do you got any other aspirations to yeah. follow your degree or I, I, I don't not know. thinking of it yet? Not really think. I probably would go into the business realm. I think yeah. uh, I'd like to probably stay in the U.S. Um I know retirement would uh, would look if ideally look like a lake house, <laughs> just on the lake, have my have my two boats there, and yeah. and, uh, and life is good. But it's a long way until that. Happens. Long way, dude. Long way. long way. Yeah, a lot of balls to be hit. A lot of balls yeah. to be hit. But yeah, that that would be the ultimate retirement spot. Yeah, epic, man. Yeah. Dude, Waltz, thanks so much for yeah. joining me here. It's sick to pick your brain, and yeah. uh, you, you've had a yeah, you've had a unbelievable journey. I um, I remember playing you at Gladstone. Uh, I'm going to say I was, I'm going to say you were probably 15, 14. Always thought you were a good player, but I have been, uh, and uh, I have been really impressed with the way that, um, I reckon you've, you've been uh, somewhat of a, of a later bloomer. I reckon your strides have been made uh, um, later coming through college and you've been a, yeah, just super good example for, um, yeah, just of, of, of doing things on your own and, and great work ethic and great attitude on court. Um, yeah, love the way you go about things. Love the way you manage your, your, yourself on court and um, uh, stoked to still call you Aussie, mate. You're still one of us. Yeah. But uh, I wish you wish you all the best, dude. I'm backing you to make USQs. I reckon, and uh, I reckon your future's career may be done. <laughs> so... Um, so keep going, dude. Yeah. And uh, yeah, wish you all the best no, this week. Thank you. Thank you. Have Come on time. Me on. No worries, brother. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs>